Everybody deserves a good quality care in terms of the medicine. I really think that it's, it's fair that if the patient knows the surgery, but knows the treatment, but doesn't get it, well, it's his own choice. It's a fair situation. But I think it's unfair if the patient wasn't able to get the surgery because he didn't know about the presence of the surgery. Good morning, it's great to see you. Good morning, good to see you again, Helen. How are you today? Great, great. So, you've been very busy. I hear you recently visited Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a bit about that trip? What took you to Vietnam? train how to do the penile implant in the Vietnam. So it was a very honorable moment for me because it was a great honor because uh, it was the first time in the Vietnam's history doing the inflatable penile prosthesis. So that's why I went there. So a very monumentous trip, you could say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> Good. And how much experience do you have in this field? I guess I've been in this field for the past seven years now and I have done around a little more than a thousand cases of the inflatable penile implants. Mm -hmm. They may not sound a lot of cases, but uh, usually big implanter in the U.S., the criteria is uh, 25 cases per year. Uh, if they do more than 25 cases per year, they can be named as a big implanter. But I usually have done about more than 200 cases a year, so actually outside the U.S., I may be doing the most cases yearly. How was the Vietnamese hospital? How did you find the staff and surgeons there? I arrived at Vietnam 11, 10 p.m. and they were waiting for me right in front of the uh, airplane exit. It was that late but they were still working, uh, waiting for me uh, to greet me. So they were very uh, passionate and enthusiastic people. Yeah, they were so excited for your visit. Yeah, it, looks like, it looked like that. So I never get a flower in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> it was my first time, and everybody was watching me. What, what the heck, that guy was in getting a flower, something like that, so. And what was the first thing you had to do when you came to the hospital? First thing I had to do was to show the surgeons how to do the surgery, uh, to give them a heads up with the, the procedures we are going to do, and show them the video of the surgery so that they can understand and expect what we'll go through. And I understand there were two surgeries that day. Yeah. So the first one you performed. Can you tell me about how that went? The first case, it is better to show them how to do it. Mm -hmm. And by while doing so, you have to hands-on. Let their hands-on to the you know, patient as well. So you do this side. As we have a left and right side, you know, I do right side, they do left side. So and they're back also and forth. Taking, they, part? They're taking, taking part in the surgery. So that's the first case, how the first case went. Mm -hmm. And the second surgery then was performed by the Vietnamese surgeon? Sure. So uh, next case, it should be uh, lead, led by him. He was uh, in the surgeon's position. I was in the assistant position. And I was trying to, you know, uh, ask him questions. Like, uh, okay, Dr. Min, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, was, I was questioning him, what's next? What's next? <laughs> Something like this, so that he can remember the every single point and every single important steps mm -hmm. when there is not, um, when there, I mean, they, I won't be there. I can't be there, right? I have to come here back. So he should be able to run his own. But I just want to give him a very important points to be remembered. And as this was the very first penile implant case mm -hmm. in Vietnam, we heard a lot of people came to watch the surgery. Was it just the staff oh. in the hospital? Uh. You had to see the sight. When I was doing the first case, there was uh, almost, I wasn't able to see it, but uh, guys who were sitting there, I mean, told, told me, there was a TV broadcasting team there. Wow. And the uh, camera was on live, and the 30 other surgeons were around us, and 20 more outside the room was watching the surgery. So can you tell me more about the broadcasting in Vietnam? So it was like a national, you know, uh, broadcasting uh, parties, like uh, in Korea, it's like uh, KBS or NBC, but in your country, BBC? BBC. Maybe, yeah. something like that. After all the surgeries done, all the, you know, official workshop was closed. Mm -hmm. And at the dinner, they told us that at the 6.30 in the Vietnam time, at that day, uh, the event we had was uh, on TV. Uh, on the main broadcasting, you know, party. It was a huge, I mean, event. 
and the Vietnam it looks like. The hospital which held this, all this event was uh, the People's One on Five Hospital in Ho Chi Minh City. So it's a more than 2,000 beds hospital. 2,000 beds is almost as big as uh, Asan Hospital or something like that. One of the biggest hospitals in South Korea. A uh, huge hospital with a lot of attention there. So it was a very uh, interesting experience and a very exciting experience for me because uh, I never knew that I would be on the you know, TV screen yeah. talking about the penile implant, but <laughs> it happened there. And there was not only training involved, I understand there was a presentation and a question and answer session. I mean, they wanted to talk about everything about the penile implant from the post of pre-op, op operation and post of everything. So I had to take the general aspect of the penile implant. Wow, it was a long talk. I had to, they gave me 45 minutes, which was <laughs> the longest talk I ever done. And how do you feel your presentation was received? I don't know, actually, because uh, most people were using the translators. Mm -hmm. So someone was translating my talk mm -hmm. in Vietnamese. I don't know how they translated, but they kept asking me questions after the talk. Maybe I was able to give them some, some curiosity as well. So how do you make time for these trainings besides already running your own center? I was trained by the Dr. Wilson from in the US. Mm -hmm. He has been trained more than 3,000 surgeons around the world. He has been in this field for the past 42 years. I call him Papa because yeah. uh, <laughs> he showed me how to live one's own life. At a certain point, we all understand that money is not everything. And I always wanted to be like Dr. Wilson. Papa has always been very enthusiastic of the training the new young surgeons. Let's say if I'm gone, if I die, my surgical skills will be lost as well. Someone should carry the torch toward the next generation. And would you like to do it again in the future? Do you sure. hope to be a doctor? I mean, <laughs> yeah. If they want me, I'll always go there. And uh, my next trip is to the Saudi. So mm -hmm. I haven't been to Arabian uh, countries before. I don't know any people actually coming from there. But still, it's a great excitement for me because I want to see and know uh, their culture and uh, their uh, system and their circumstances as well. How do you think that will be different to your trip to Vietnam? Honestly, I don't know. I can only tell you after I go there. <laughs> so, very happy. I'm very excited at the same time, becoming pressured as well so that I because I have to prepare uh, very well so that I can uh, help them when I go there. Well, I wish you lots of luck in Saudi Arabia. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming <laughs> to speak to us today. Great moment, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. <laughs>